All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the fourth lecture. Now we're really on a roll. This is the second half of the chapter on the application layer, and we're going to be talking about the domain name service, or DNS as it's known. And we're going to spend a lot of time on this because it's really quite important. In the last lecture, we introduced application layer protocols. Uh, we described HTTP, the hypertext transport protocol, in a lot of detail. HTTP, like most application layer protocols, are built on top of TCP because TCP pr provides uh, the illusion of a reliable bidirectional stream of communication between two machines. And so it kind of hides a lot of details of the network. We talked about two different styles of application architecture, a client-server architecture, which was the most common, involved um, servers that were uh, kind of always on and always listening, that were storing a lot of data typically, and um, handling requests. The clients are making the requests, the servers are generating responses. The alternative to that was a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, which is more scalable because it doesn't require you to have um, deploy server capacity to match your client capacity, but it's much more difficult to organize because you have to get um, customers' machines, basically, uh, to do all the work even though they are moving around and not always on and whatnot. All right, so HTTP uh, was invented in the uh, early 90s for fetching documents for web servers, from web servers to implement you know, the web, as, uh, which has evolved over time, but the basic idea of having a bunch of pages to sp display information and link between them uh, hasn't really changed since the beginning. Uh, so it involves things like URLs, uh, which, and um, different things you can do with those URLs, usually um, like getting them or, or posting data to uh, to servers. It uses human readable headers. Uh, but nowadays HTTP is used for much more than just web pages. It's also used as the basis for basically um, the majority of request response interactions. Not all of them, but a lot of them. REST APIs in particular are a, a, a way of specifying uh, server to server interactions or client server interactions that's based on top of on, on HTTP. So it uses URLs uh, for generic um, requests, not, not, not that browsers are driving, but maybe a smartphone is making a request to a, a game uh, backend, something like that. We also looked at SMTP, the uh, simple mail transport protocol, I guess, uh, which was an earlier application invented in about 1982 for sending email. Unlike HTTP, it's stateful, so it has a slightly different style. Um, a stateless uh, protocol doesn't need to remember anything about previous requests in order to handle a given request correctly. So uh, basically all the information you need is in one message. That's how HTTP is, is designed. SMTP, on the other hand, you have this whole series of messages that together uh, give all the information you need to handle the request. All right, so that's enough for the review. Um, we did talk last time in HTTP a little bit about cookies as a way to solve this problem of making um, using a, a stateless protocol, HTTP, to handle web interactions, which actually do uh, kind of need to remem remember things about the past in, in future requests. So like, for example, you might log into a website and then later on make a request to get information about your account. That second request where you get information about your account should only be allowed to proceed if you have previously logged in. The solution to this, to this, uh, to make the way this is enabled on the web is with cookies. So your first request returns a cookie to the browser, and then that is a essentially a, a kind of password or session identifier that will be included in every future request to the same domain. That allows the backend to then check its database to to uh, remember the history of, of what that user has done, basically. Okay, so that, that's how cookies are intended to be used. Recently, third-party cookies have also been used uh, to track users all around the web in ways that probably users are not uh, too happy about if they really knew about it. Okay, so third-party cookies are, third, are called third-party because they... Uh, are related to a domain different than the page you're currently viewing. So a good, a common example of this is uh, Facebook and other social media platforms. In order for Facebook, which is in the business of selling advertisements, and those advertisements are more valuable if they are customized 
to the users. Um, Facebook wants to learn as much as they can about users, just like all the other big tech companies do, basically. Um, what Facebook does is it encourages its affiliates, so basically websites that, that have a Facebook like button or a Facebook share button. Um, if there is, for example, a little, any kind of Facebook uh, widget on another website, in this case, it could even be a one pixel GIF. This is a very common way of doing tracking. So you ask another website to include a tiny um, image. This is an HTML tag for an image. It's, a fa it's an image that's served from Facebook. There's no content here, so it doesn't actually affect the appearance of the website. It's just one pixel big, so it's tiny, tiny, tiny. But what the browser will do when it sees this HTML element is it will make this a request, an HTTP GET request to this um, the, the Facebook.com server to the path tracker slash pix.gif. And when it makes that request, because of the way cookies are, are, are used, or the that request to Facebook will include uh, the user's Facebook cookies. So whatever bra whatever cookies the browser has stored for Facebook uh, will be sent along with this request for the image. And that request also will include a referrer header, which lists the page from which this request was made. So Facebook is getting a cookie getting your Facebook cookie, which tells them who you are. So it's your, like if, if you've logged into Facebook with that browser, that, there will be a cookie that tells Facebook who you are. And there also will be a referrer header that tells them what website you were just on. Okay, so they're they're getting a record of, of that you visited this website, even though it's not a Facebook website. Okay. So this is a, a technique for um, tracking users around the web. There are plugins like uh, Ghostery, for example. Uh, Adblock Plus is another one, and there are probably others that you can install in browsers that block, that have a list of well-known um, trackers. That's what these things are generally called. Uh, things that, that send cookies back to third parties. Um, you, usually these things are not actually providing any functionality on the page you're visiting, so they can be blocked without affecting your, your web browsing experience. All you're doing is blocking information from flowing to um, some third party. Now, just to see a demonstration of how many of these third-party cookies there are, um, you can actually see this. All, all web browsers have tools to examine lots of things, including cookies. So here's an example. When I visit uh, Northwestern's web page, or when I did this uh, a few months ago, uh, there's a long list of cookies. These are actually first-party cookies, so these are not third-party cookies. These are cookies that are used by the uh, northwestern.edu website. And some of these re relate to probably... Um, preferences I've expressed by clicking things on the website. Others might have to do with the, the, the my login. That's why I've kind of dimmed out some of the, the values because they're kind of like passwords. In this case, this browsing session is using the Ghostery plugin, which blocks third party, most third party um, cookies and, and trackers. So these are all um, from Northwestern or EDU. But if I disable that plugin, like maybe most of you are experience the web and I go to a, a common page like the New York Times homepage. So the New York Times also is in the business of selling ads and they've partnered with a ton of different companies to help them make money selling ads. And uh, when I visit NewYorkTimes.com New York I see third-party cookies from lots of different companies that are in the business of online ads. So Google.com, Yahoo.com, DoubleClick.net, uh, Scorecard Research, uh, there's an Amazon one, bluekai.com, I don't know what that is, but um, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Okay, So visiting one website informs dozens of different um, companies uh, of my activity if I allow it to happen. And just, you can actually, the, the browser has them organized according to the domain, so you can see that there actually are even multiple cookies per domain, like Amazon has two cookies that are um, sent, including my identification. Um, this other one, I don't know what it is, has um, several, and so on. Okay, so cookies are, are a name that's appealing and sounds great and fun, um, but they, I mean, as you've pr probably heard from paying attention to the news and whatnot, um, they can have a negative impact on uh, on user experience on the web as well. So. Um, cookies are secrets, 
uh, that, that was the whole point. Very often they're secrets. They don't have to be, but but in order to implement uh, login, we need cookies. So if if I steal your browser's cookies and I copy them to my browser, then um, I I can visit any visit that any websites I visit recognize me as you. This I shouldn't be there uh, because because I'll I'll present the same cookies that you would. Uh, when you visit that website. And uh, web browsers implement a security policy that isolates cookies by domain so that when I visit um, facebook.com or, or make a requ any request to facebook.com, only the Facebook cookies are sent to that server. In other words, only the, the cookies that were given to the browser by a Facebook domain machine are returned back. But when I visit, like, like if I'm logged into both Gmail and Facebook, I'm only going to send to the browser will only send to gmail.com my uh, Gmail cookies. It won't send my Facebook cookies there. Uh, but like I said, with these with these third party trackers, it might when I visit the page, it might cause me to make a request to Facebook to send my Facebook uh, cookie to Facebook. Yeah, cookies have expiration dates, um, and that's why you have to re-sign into websites once in a while. So even if you didn't sign out of a website, I'm sure you've had this experience where you have to log back in again. Um, that's because your cookie expired either on your client side or maybe in the database they just cleared out the record uh, for your cookie. And when you sign out of a page, when you click a sign out button on a, a web page, usually uh, what should happen is that the browser will clear your cookie locally and this on this also on the back end side, whatever database is storing that cookie should probably um, remove it so that if you try to use that cookie again, uh, it no, no longer will work, right? That's how you, you enforce the fact that you're logged out. Cookies um, introduce a couple of interesting security problems sometimes. Uh, there's a certain type of attack called uh, CSRF or cross-site request forgery. Uh, because remember the browser will include cookies to when making requests to third parties. Um, if you have an API, like he, here's here's a case where I'm running a website, like I'm running a malicious website, but I'm trying to get visitors to my website to make a request to a banking website that they're logged into. And, so, and I'm gonna, I, I actually control that request and that request will be authenticated with the cookies that that browser has stored for that banking website. So in, for example, in my uh, web page, I can include a, li a link to an image or some other way. I, I just made it as an image to, to simplify it. That has a, a, a URL as follows, like mybank.com, you know, whatever, it could be Citibank or whatever or bank you use. And then some path, which is maybe a REST API, like transfer, and then it has some parameters like the account name, the amount, and who I'm sending the money to. So if this is on, if this tag is on my web page and someone visits it, then the browser will make this request to this third party site and it will include the login credentials, the cookies basically, uh, for that third party site. And, and it, so you have to design um, the way you're using cookies and the way you're designing your APIs to prevent this kind of um, problem, these problems from happening. Um, okay. So if, for example, you can, there's a same site attribute that you can add to cookies that would prevent uh, a cookie from being used on a, from requests that, that or originate from third party um, from other web domains that would prevent CSRF attacks. Okay, uh, so that's enough. That was still kind of reviewing last lecture HTTP. Uh, so we're going to move on now to a new topic. Okay, so if you need a break, although we just got started, now would be a, a, a good breaking point. So next we're going to talk about the domain name service, DNS. I've mentioned before that every machine on the internet has an IP address. Uh, so IP version four addresses are these uh, dotted quad numbers, four numbers with dots between them, which you may have seen. Um, IP version six addresses are longer because there are more IPv6 addresses. We'll talk later on about what the difference is. And, uh, but basically, for now, just imagine every machine has a numeric address. Um, that's convenient for computers because uh, We'll see later that they can help with routing by, by, by organizing machines in a hierarchical way. 
But if we want to connect to a machine, we, we need to know what that numeric address is, and that can be difficult uh, to know. Like you don't want to have to remember all these numeric addresses, especially given that uh, the network is changing, machines are coming and going, and um, we don't want to have to like tell everyone in the world what our new IP address is every time someone might need it. So we have the service called the domain ser name service that um, allows domain names, you know, like something dot something dot something maybe, uh, to map to IP addresses. So for example, northwestern.edu can map to 129.105.136.70. This is an IP address on the right-hand side. Um, northwestern.edu is something that lives for a long time, has long-term meaning. It's something that I can hard can code into programs. I can tell people, hey, my website's northwestern.edu. It's human-friendly. It's memorable. Um, the IP address is not so memorable, and that can change over time. As I, you know, I might get a new internet service. Um, the machine might die. I might want to upgrade. So there are a lot of reasons that why the IP address might change. We can, we can just, as long as we have a layer of indirection, we can change the mapping between the domain name and the IP address, and allow the service to continue to operate from one domain name. Okay. So IP addresses are bound to machines and particular locations in the in the network. Uh, which is good for routing, but not so good for uh, for reachability and for human services. Like, um, you don't want to have to email someone by typing in their current IP address if that IP address changes. You want to just email them by saying that there it's a username at a certain domain that's constant. Same thing with websites. You want to visit websites using a constant domain, not IP addresses that are hard to remember and that change. Right? Host names are associated with services, not machines, and they're, they're in some sense more permanent. They can be more permanent than IP addresses because you, with this mapping, you have this mapping that the domain name service provides that can change, okay? All right, so la layers of indirection are a common solution to uh, software problems. DNS is one of them. There are two RFCs that define DNS. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but RFCs I did very briefly, but just to remind you, RFCs are the internet standard documents. These are documents that define protocols that the um, IETF, the Internet Engineering Task, Task Force, is responsible for um, organizing the process to define internet standards. So anyway, you can click these links in the PDFs and or Google these numbers, RFC uh, 1034 or 1035, and you, you can see a, a detailed definition of, of DNS. And actually, these specifications are pretty human readable, surprisingly. Uh, sometimes more human readable than a textbook. So sometimes reading the RFCs is the best way to learn about a protocol instead of just Googling for random you know, blog posts or Stack Overflow posts. All right, so IP addresses are numeric and are used for routing. In other words, they're, um, they're used to figure out how to get packets to their destination. Um, Nearby IP addresses are usually physically close to, each, to together in the network, so the IP addresses are, are associated with the network location in some way. Generally, the leftmost bits, the most significant bits, are for global location, and as you move toward the right, you get more local. This is not totally true, but kind of. So um, I don't know how much you know about telephone numbers because telephones are less um, common than, than they used to be, I guess. People use telephones less, but... Uh, the way the way phone numbers work is that you you have this strict hierarchy where on the left hand side you have a global region like my my office phone number is one eight four seven four nine one seven zero six nine the one is is the country code for the USA the eight four seven is an area code for the region within the USA so this corresponds to Northeast Illinois so all the numbers that are in within a few miles of here uh, theoretically should have the same first four digits. After that, there are two numbers, 49, that correspond to the exchange, which is Northwestern's campus. So this is, again, getting closer to the particular location. And then finally, there are five, the five, last five digits specify the particular Northwestern phone. Okay. So this is a hierarchical um, numbering scheme. And having this kind of a scheme lets you build the connections in the network in such a way that you can easily find what path to travel along to reach any other location on the internet. Now, in reality, the internet is not really organized in as simple a manner as the telephone system in a strictly hierarchical manner where um, the numbers always tell you a lot of information about location. Um, it's 
usually usually to the the bottom few numbers are all nearby. If you if you just change the bottom numbers, you, you get other nearby locations. But all bets are off when you go to the highest uh, the highest numbers in the address. Okay, so this is, so this, it's a simplification to say that uh, internet addresses that the numbers are used directly for routing, but they kind of are. Okay, we'll, but we have a lot of um, we have two chapters. We're going to talk about how the IP addresses are used uh, for routing. So don't worry too much about it for, right now. All right, but what DNS provides is a global directory for internet addresses. So it's a global internet directory. I'm showing in the background here a telephone book. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a telephone book before, but these were important when I was a kid. Uh, if you wanted to call someone up on the phone, uh, of course you needed to know their phone number because um, phones didn't have uh, memories. And... Uh, you either memorized your friend's phone numbers, like I, I had memorized my, uh, my my good friend's phone numbers and, and my grandparents' phone numbers and things like that, or you got out your phone book and looked up their name and found the number, okay? And here's a, a, a zoom in, right? So you have uh, last name, first name. So you probably know someone's name, and and if you if there's several people with the same name, like there, there are many different uh, Thomas Casey's, so T-H-O-S is an abbreviation for Thomas, um, those, if you don't know which of the different Thomas Casey's you're talking about, they also have a street address listed here, so you can disambiguate them and get the uh, numeric telephone number, and then you actually dial in the number to call them, right? So you want to talk to a person by name, you know their name, but you need to get their phone number. DNS does the same thing with host names and IP addresses, okay? But you can't have a book, obviously, like a printed book that lists all the IP addresses and host names on the internet because there are many millions of them, if not billions. So um, you also, I mean, obviously a paper co uh, directory is absurd, but even just a single database on a single machine is also not going to work because there are a ton of entries that they change a lot and uh, there are a ton of requests that need to be made to that directory, right? Every time someone visits a web page or, or sends an email or does anything with a computer basically there there could be a dns lookup that has to happen first to translate from a host name to an ip address so all these like you know millions of requests probably per second uh the need to be handled can't be handled by one machine okay also you don't if there was one machine that handled it that that, that would be far away from a lot of people so there'd be a lot of latency like the request would take a long time to travel there and the response to travel back and that would be no good right so we want to make DNS scalable, in other words, capable of handling a lot of traffic, this lookup system. Uh, we want to provide IP address lookups for all the machines on the internet. So I want you to stop and think about ways that you can accomplish that in a way that's scalable. Okay. So I hope you you thought about that for a second, how to make DNS scalable. The rest of the lecture will, most of the rest of the lecture will talk about that, but just at a high level, the two basic solutions are to Distribute the database across many machines, so you can have many machines in parallel that are responsible for different parts of the directory. In other words, you take that big telephone book and you cut it into different, you break it into different parts, and you give different different uh, machines different sections of the database, and uh, users will ask the appropriate database uh, node, let's say, when they want an answer. That's that's the, the basic idea of distributing a database. And caching is another solution. Caching is when you uh, store the recent answers for reuse. Okay, because very often you're revisiting the same websites. Like if I visit um, google.com to do search, then I get a result. That second page that shows the results is still a web page under the google.com domain. So the same IP address is going to be contacted, right? So I don't, I don't need to make a second request the second time. I just need to remember the answer I got the first time. The same thing applies not just for an individual user over the time period of seconds, but across many users who are together in a, in a given location, whether it's like, you know, on Northwestern's campus, if there's one, if one user asks for the IP address for google.com, and then like two seconds later, another user asks for the same um, IP address, the same host name, they should be able to get an answer, um, get the same answer if someone nearby is storing, is storing that. Okay, and we'll see how that works as well. Okay, so 
in order to distribute the the work of DNS, both to handle um, a lot of parallel reads, but also to handle a lot of parallel writes, like when data is changed, both of those 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 um, reads and writes both need to be parallelized across many different servers to make it efficient. We have a hierarchical and distributed system. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen that domains have like multiple levels of dot of like dot somethings, right? So there's um we have what are called top level domains like com, org, edu, there are other ones for other countries, um, you know, biz, whatever. Like and what those do is actually divide the domain space into um, different servers that handle those different top level domains. Okay, and then underneath those are, are, are can be domains like yahoo.com and amazon.com are both subdomains of com. pbs.org is a subdomain of org. You know, we can have two different universities that are subdomains of edu. And this hierarchy can continue to multiple levels. So kellogg.northwestern.edu is a subdomain of northwestern.edu. cs.northwestern.edu is also a subdomain of northwestern.edu. And each of these um, subdomains, regardless of how many dots it has, like how many levels it has, these are all um, subdomains that can have their own authoritative name servers. So name servers are the servers, are the actual directories where the information about IP address and domain uh, relationship is stored, but it's split across uh, different name servers. And there's one there's one set of name servers that are authoritative for a given subdomain. So the pbs.org IP addresses are stored in a set of DNS servers here. For now, you can think of it as one DNS server, but typically you would list several of them to be redundant. Uh, those IP addresses for pbs.org are not stored anywhere else. Northwestern.edu does not store the IP addresses for pbs.org. It just stores its own IP addresses. Okay, same thing for... Um, but Northwestern.edu might not store the Kellogg.Northwestern.edu IP addresses. The sub, except it'll only it'll store the the one set of IP addresses for the the point to the name server for that um, domain, which we'll see in a second. Okay, there also are root DNS servers that define that allow you to discover what all the possible top level domains are and what the and to find the IP addresses of these of the DNS the authoritative name servers for the various top level domains. Okay, so each of these domains, uh, DNS servers, has an IP address, and it's reachable by IP address. You know, you can't use a, a you can't really use a, a, a DNS name, a domain name, a, a host name to contact a DNS server because the whole point of the DNS server is to tell you what IP addresses correspond to host names. Okay, now the way that this, just to give you a little more information insight into how this works. Let's say I want to create stevetarzi.com as I have. Um, I have to, if I want to create subdomains under that, like www.stevetarzi.com and mail.stevetarzi.com, those are domains that I can, that I control. In order to create those, I have to run, in, or run my own DNS server that is going to store those IP addresses. And I have to add an entry in the in whatever the, t the level above me is. In this case, since it's stevetarzi.com, the level above is just com. So in the doc, in the dot com um, top level domain, those, those DNS servers, I have to get them to add an entry with the IP address for my DNS servers so that um, it can be found by everyone else in the world. Right, because I, I can start running my own DNS server, but no one will know about it unless, the, the, unless there's some, some reference to it. The reference to it is stored in the whatever the upper level is, which is the .com DNS servers. Okay, and keep in mind also, like I, I can create whatever subdomains I want off of my domain. So I can create citibank.stevetarzi.com, and um, you know run my a phishing operation to to try to scam users into uh, giving me their their banking passwords and stuff like that. So that's why when you get emails and stuff for um, especially for important financial uh, or other other things they're asking for your passwords. You need to check the, the URL to make sure that there is nothing in between the domain you expect and the uh, the top level domain. So that the fact that it's like citibank.something.com means that whatever whatever is at, at the, the to the right of the uh, the, the rightmost words in this domain name sequence 
are uh, are in control of when it comes to the left. So. Okay, I mentioned at the top of that tree that there there are root DNS servers. There are actually thirteen different IP addresses for root DNS servers. So these are DNS servers that um, store the IP address IP addresses of the um, top-level domain name servers. So, for example, com.net.uk.edu.cn and, and so forth. The way that um, we can find, you know, if, we, if I want to look up google.com, I need to first find the, DNA, the name server for .com. In order to start to find that, I can contact a root DNS server, one of these 13 machines. And they're scattered throughout the world. Of course, a lot of them are in the U.S. because the internet was kind of the in the early days developed mostly in the US um, and but keep in mind actually there are sort of 13 IP addresses for different root level domains you can contact any one of them to get information about the top level domains below it but um, these are actually redundant these aren't just 13 machines literally um, you can use IP anycast to create load balancing so you can have multiple machines that are uh, handling these requests. So that, that's hard to explain without, I can't really explain that until the middle of the quarter. Uh, so we'll talk more about this in the, in the middle uh, to, of the quarter, uh, how you can load balance uh, at the IP layer with IP Anycast. But for now, you can just think of these as 13 machines around the world. And those have to be hard coded into your client if you want to use the DNS system, I guess. Okay, so using this hierarchical system, uh, this illustration should give you a little more information about how that works. Um, so I have a client here. So this is my machine that I'm trying to browse the web. Okay, this is, this is my laptop or, or desktop. I want to visit a website, cs.umass.edu. In order to do that, I have to make an HTTP GET request to whatever IP address is associated with this host name. So I need to translate this host name from a host name to an IP address. And then I need to create a TCP connection to that IP address. Okay, so this, th that's the machine down here I'm trying to connect. But so far, I have no idea where it is. I don't know what this IP address is. Okay, so I have to do a, a query through the DNS hi hierarchy to do that. So I, I do this iteratively starting at the as high as I need to. So in general, if I know nothing at all, if I've done, made no prior requests and haven't accumulated any knowledge about IP addresses and host names, I, I can start with the root. So what, remember, remember, I'll have those 13 um, IP addresses hard-coded in my machine. I'll just pick one of them, send a request, and ask, you know, hey, what's the IP address of cs.umass.edu? This root DNS server actually won't know the answer. But what it does know is uh, it knows what the IP address is for the top-level domain, edu. Remember, the root domain is responsible for what's just below it, which is the top-level domain, so the edu. So it, it will give me back in step two the IP address of the of the, the DNS the authoritative DNS server or actually really servers plural for dot, for dot edu. Okay, so I don't have the answer, but I've gotten closer. So then step three, I'll make a request to this other DNS server to ask again what's the IP address for cs.umass.edu. This one will not know the answer either, but because it's it's the authoritative name server for edu, it knows about the level just below it. So it knows about umass.edu. So in step four, it'll return back the IP address for the authoritative name server for UMass at EDU. Then I, again, the client makes a third request to this other server. It's getting closer and closer. Now this time, the server does know, so this here will, will this, this third DNS server will have the IP address for CS at UMass at EDU, and it will give the answer back to the client, okay? That's how it works, kind of. So these these three machines correspond to three levels in that the hierarchical tree. I start with the root and move down. Um, so I want you to actually think about this for a second. Uh, what are the performance problems that you see with this scheme? Performance for the client. Okay. Why is this not the most efficient way for this to operate? This is a way that you can use DNS, but it's not the way it typically works. Okay. So stop and think about that. All right, so some of the problems include the fact that uh, my request went to a root DNS server. Um, if everyone is doing this, then everyone is contacting root DNS servers for all of their requests. 
and that's putting a lot of load on those root DNS servers. So remember, I, I, we, we said that we were using a distributed, hierarch a distributed hierarchical system to scale it, to, to create to not have a bottleneck of one machine or even 13 machines for all the traffic. This scheme doesn't really solve that. Um, except we, we can solve that by just having the client remember. Uh, so maybe the first time it, it does a DNS lookup, it will, it will check at the root level. But then after step two, this, this client now actually has the IP address for the top level domain edu. Now, the next time it needs to know anything about a .edu domain, it can go directly to this edu server. So when, when like cs.northwestern.edu comes up as a website I want to visit, I no longer have to go to the root server. I can go straight to the uh, .edu top-level domain server. Okay, so that's, that's a way of using caching to improve the performance. Okay, so remember results and reuse them. Okay. And... Um, yeah, we're going to have, uh, if every request requires a DNS lookup, then common sites like google.com would cause clients to make lots of DNS requests, especially, and that can cause a lot of load. Um, so we don't want to, we don't want to like repeatedly make the same requests. We'll find ways to, to solve that problem soon. Okay. So one of the, the important ways to reduce uh, load in the DNS hierarchy is to introduce local DNS resolvers. So I've added a fourth DNS server. So it looks the same as the other ones visually, but maybe it would, would have been better to give it a different color or something because it's actually quite different than the uh, previous three. Okay, so this local DNS server, this is, this is a server that's operated by my internet service provider or access network. So if I'm on Northwestern's campus, it's a server like, operated by NUIT on Northwestern's campus. And the, all the machines on campus will make their DNS requests to that, D, that local DNS resolver. It, so it'll act as a proxy. So a proxy is an intermediary or middleman for a request. Instead of making the request dire myself directly to the, to the root and so on, instead I give it to someone else, this local DNS server, and it will do the work for me that I previously was doing and give me an answer. Okay, what's the benefit of that? Well, um, it's because it, in, it increases the ability to do caching. So caching, like I mentioned before, is saving recent responses so they can be reused without doing all the work to regenerate them in the first place. Um, so this, this, if this DNS server is just does nothing but, but handles DNS requests, and it's doing that for a lot of users in the same place, like all the Northwestern uh, students and faculty and staff, and it's going to have a lot of memory of recent answers. It's going to know about a lot of IP addresses, basically, that it has been asked about recently. So when someone comes in and asks again, hey, what's, what's gmail.com's IP address? It's going to be like, oh, I've, I, I got this question like a thousand times in the last minute. Here's the answer. Like, I know the answer immediately. I don't have to go, go in and ask anyone else. I don't have to do any of these steps labeled uh, two through seven to give you that answer. Okay. So that, that's a local DNS server. This is actually not part of the DNS hierarchy. It's not an authoritative name server. Uh, it doesn't store, it doesn't have information about IP addresses uh, uniquely. It only has copies of IP addresses from our authoritative name servers in the hierarchy. Okay, so it doesn't actually show up in that picture I originally showed with the tree of DNS servers. It's separate from that. It's just kind of on the side. It is accepting requests on behalf of, of clients and making those requests. If it doesn't have the answer, it'll, it'll make the requests in the same way that I showed before. But if it does have an answer from recently that hasn't expired, it'll just give that answer directly back to the client. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, these are important in reducing the load uh, on, on, that falls on the authoritative DNS servers. Okay. Just as a side note, um, I showed before an iterative way of doing queries where we went to the root, the root said, I don't have an answer, uh, but talk to this other server. It's also possible uh, that a, a DNS server you contact would make a request recursively for you and give you an answer. So originally we asked the root DNS server for the, do, the uh, IP address of cs.umass.edu and it said it, it just gave us information about like the level below. Theoretically, it could make that request for us. It could get that information for us. If these all were acting in a very kind manner, um, they could get the information I was asking for and give me the answer immediately. So um, you might get lucky sometimes and get an answer for like deeper down in the hierarchy from a higher level DNS server, but it's not too common. Uh, 
Okay, so I talked about caching as an important way of improving the performance of DNS, but caching uh, caching uh, is useful, but we can't allow records to be cached forever. If we did, then the system would be static and IP addresses could never change. IP addresses do change because machines get replaced, the network uh, network topology changes, and uh, you know new new machines join the network. So we need DNS to be able to change, uh, but we do want to keep some ca some record of recent answers. The, the solution for this, like the, the trade-off we have here, is to introduce an expiration time on DNS records, which is called a time to live or TTL. This is a common term in any kind of caching system, TTL. So DNS re query responses are cached, which is to say remembered at the edge of the network, only for the amount of time that is specified by the author of that record. Okay, so you as, a, um, as, a, uh, as, as an owner of a domain, like if I, I, I control ctarzy.com, I have several records under there. For each one of those records, I specify what the time to live should be, what the TTL should be. And by doing that, so for example, it could be a value between 300 and let's say 86,000 seconds. This corresponds, it's specified in seconds. This corresponds to five minutes to 24 hours. So if, if I, can, I, can set, I can say that the values last for a long time or they expire quickly. Or um, and by doing that, I, I allow... I give the recipients some confidence that they can they can remember the, the record for a certain amount of time, but after that amount of time, they need to actually ask again because maybe the value has changed. Okay. Now, there's actually a trade-off here. So you're allowed to set a range of values because those setting different values has different effects. So I want you to stop and think about why you would not want to set the TTL always to a very low value. Like the benefit of setting it to a low value, of course, is it allows you to make a change and for that change to be seen immediately. So if I set the TTL of a record to be like 60 seconds and I change the IP address for um, steptarji.com, then I can make the requests start flowing to that new IP address pretty quickly, you know, within 60 seconds because no one, no one will have remembered the old value after 60 seconds. So it seems like a good thing, right? Uh, but what's the, what's the downside there? Stop and think about that. Okay, so what I hope you came up with was that you have a trade-off here between the uh, the delay in your changes being seen on the one hand and the load that, that is put on the DNS servers. If I set the TTL very low, like 60 seconds, that means that, that my DNS server is going to get a lot of requests uh, because even people who visited my website recently are going to have to ask again pretty frequently. On the other hand, if I set the value to a very high value, like five days, that would put very little load on my DNS servers because if anyone, if a person has visited, visited my website within five days, they don't have to make another request to the DNS server. The downside, of course, is that if I change my IP address and I change a record in, in DNS, then then that will not have been that won't be seen by everyone for five days. Right, so there'll be, be a, a window of time during which some users will be contacting the old IP address, other users will be contacting the new IP address. That cut over time has to be, it would be longer, which is inconvenient for operating a website. Okay, just to give an example, here's the what the interface looks like on Amazon Web Services. AWS has a really um, easy to use DNS um, service called Route 53 that lets you in a graphical tool kind of define uh, what you want your DNS records to be. So here are all the subdomains I have for under stevetarzy.com and all the DNS records. So, so far I've defined, what we've been talking about so far is actually just a, one type of DNS records, which are called A records. So all the ones you see here, they're listed as A. These map from domain to IP address, like um, grits at stevetarzy.com maps to this number here, this IP address number. On the right-hand side, you see the TTL, okay? I was just talking about that. There also are, are are different types. Like for example, the MX record is a special type of record that indicates what the mail server is for this domain. So if someone sends a mail to Steve at stevetarzy.com, this is my personal address, um, the SMTP server that's handling that would check, would do a DNS MX type lookup on the, the domain of the recipient and figure out that actually the server I need to go to is mail.stevetarzy.com. Then an, an, 
that you'll see down here, there's an A record that translates that to this IP address, which happens to be this, the, the grits machine. Okay. So there are different types of DNS records for different uses. The A records are what I talked about first. These are used for websites and for SSH and, and just generally mapping, connecting an IP address to a host name. Um, there also are trip quad A records for IP version six, same basic idea um, there. So you can you can have a single domain that, that that works on both the IP version four and IP version six internet. Um, NS records are name server records. So this this allows these are actually put in the level above. So so the, the .com top level domain name servers have an NS record for Steve Tarzi .com. So it's something underneath .com, and that allows uh, that that allows that higher level domain to to give answers that direct users closer to the um, to the desired uh, domain that they're querying. Um, I mentioned the MX records for email servers. So if you're sending an email to a random address, that's you know you need to look up who, what is the machine I need to connect to to send that machine, and you do an MX record to get an MX query to get that machine name. And there also are C name records that actually don't map to numbers, but instead map to other uh, domains. So you can these create aliases. So if I want to have two different domains like www.stevetarzy.com and also stevetarzy.com that kind of provide the same functionality, that, that provide the same service. I can create a C name record that stands for canonical name that translates from one from an alias to a, a canonical name, basically. So this is the one you would actually connect to on the right-hand side. There's some other ones that are less commonly used. Uh, like a lot of some of the, the SOA records have information about the DNS records themselves. Uh, SRV records are used for specific services. This is a generalization of the MX record. So, for example, if you want to figure out what the voice telephony server is for a certain domain, you can do an SRV query specifying the uh, the protocol as a prefix. Um, so, yeah. Like there's, for example, there's a, the Minecraft SRV record, which tells you what is the Minecraft server underneath a given domain, um, just to give you a, a more fun example. There are text records for generic key value storage. These are used if, uh, in particular for a certain kind of email authentication. And um, there's another record, SPF, that's related, also related to authenticating mail. The, both of these things are, 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 <laughs> are to try to prevent that email spoofing attack I showed you last time where we just sent random emails that like seem to be coming from uh, arbitrary people. Uh, that the, the, the DKIM records and the text records and the SPF records both are, are meant to uh, prevent that kind of attack from happening. But these are things you can check to, to try to verify that the email is actually coming from the, the person who controls the domain. And there also are PTR records that store reverse DNS records that is actually mapped from IP addresses to host names. Okay. But the, these are overall uh, much less important than, the, than the, the A records, the MX records, and so on. Or well, they're less commonly used anyway. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about these domains and like how do they, like how do I actually get one, let's say. There are companies that will sell you domains, and GoDaddy is like a big company that advertises its services and sponsors NASCAR drivers and stuff. Um, and so you can go to their website and you can you can check to see whether a domain is available. And if it is, you can buy it. There's a, an annual cost of about like twelve dollars, let's say, or fifteen dollars to to buy a domain. Um, now, I want you to stop and think what happens, what might happen when you buy a domain. So if I go to GoDaddy.com and buy this domain, in order for others to be able to use this domain to visit my website, so I've created a website. By doing that, I've set up a machine. That machine has an IP address. I've put, a web, I've put some HTML on there and, and stuff. And I want people to visit that IP address when they go to eecs340.com. I've bought this domain to do that. Now, what happens next? How does this, how does that domain ownership and that connection get defined? Please stop and think about that. Okay, so so the answer is basically that the uh, the top level domain needs to store an NS record for my domain server. 
So if I want to manage a certain domain, I need to I need to first set up a, D, a, a, a name server to to give out IP addresses for that for all the subdomains under that domain. And I need to tell the, the level above it, which in this case was .com, top level domain. I need to get that top, .com top level domain to add an NS record that lists my name servers. So on, in this little image on the right hand side, this shows the uh, names of the name servers for um, Amazon Web Services for, for route, route 53. So in, in, the, in the GoDaddy interface, when I buy a domain from GoDaddy, I, can, I would tell it that these are the um, these are the name servers. Uh, th these are my name server basically, which happen to be controlled, like managed by by AWS, and I control it through their interface. But but that's the basic idea. Um, the ICANN, remember, f way back from the first lecture, is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names. <laughs> so they're responsible for controlling IP addresses and domains. So what they've done is appointed one organization for each top level domain to manage the uh, sale of domains and to make sure that only one person can buy a domain at once. So the, the .com top level domain, for example, is managed by VeriSign. And there are about 100 million .com domains. So when that registrar collects your money, when I, when I buy a domain from GoDaddy.com, for example, um, they also get my name server list and they, they will cause that list to be stored by the top level domain. Right. And the ICANN collects an 18 cent fee <laughs> for uh, for managing this process. That's part of the, the 12 or $15 that I pay. All right. So DNS actually is used for more than just delivering services in a basic way, more than just you know providing a convenient way to remember how to connect to machines. It's actually a tool for managing the delivery of internet services uh, because you know, if you think about it, it decides how clients connect to servers, and that's an important um, that's an important tool, right? And th these DNS records can change over time. That allows services to move. We also can use this name this DNS system to give different answers to different clients to implement a few cool features. Um, so so far, we've we've thought about simple name servers as being static; they always return the same answer to everyone all the time. You know, unless the machine changes. You know, but at a given time, they're always returning the same answers. But dynamic name, name servers are more clever, and they, they don't give the same answer. So depending on who asks, they will give a different IP address to accomplish different goals. Okay, we'll see what that means and what those goals might be in the next few slides. So one example of that is is for round robin DNS for load balancing. Okay, so if I'm operating a big website like I don't know Amazon.com gets lots of traffic, right? Millions of users at once are on the website. I can't have one machine that is like hosting that web page. I want to have lots of machines, dozens, hundreds of machines hosting that are running the same web server software. Um, so what I can do is use, I can use DNS to accomplish that. So when people ask, what's the IP address for amazon.com? Okay, the slide actually is using the, the example of ebay.com, but let's, so let's stick with that. When, when the clients ask, what is the IP address for www.ebay.com? I can give a different IP address to different users and I can alternate. I have, I have a long list of, of IP addresses for different machines. I can just go through them one at a time and loop around. And so different users are getting different IP addresses. That means they're going to connect to different machines. And if those machines are providing the same service, they're running the same software. So it provides um, some scaling for a website or for a service in general. Okay. So you can have, you can have hundreds of different machines, thousands if you want that are all providing the same service and users are being sent to different ones depending on basically when they ask what the IP address is. Okay. Notice that this works really well for web traffic because HTTP is stateless. So if I start communicating with one server, if my web browser is having an interaction with one IP address and suddenly the um, DNS record that I have expires because the TTL uh, elapses, I might do a DNS server, a, a DNS request again to say, I might ask again, hey, what is the IP address for eBay.com? Even though I've, I'm already on the eBay website, but I'm asking again because the record expired, what's the IP address? And I get a different answer. So now suddenly my requests start going to a different eBay server. That's okay with HTTP because HTTP is stateless. Remember, every every request is self, um, 
uh, can stand alone. There's a word for that. Self-sufficient. Every request is self-sufficient. It can go to any one of many servers, and it has all the information needed to ans to answer it, um, including things like cookies that give hints about the history of the user. Okay. Um, yeah, we also can have these load balancing name servers, these dynamic name servers. They can they can monitor the health of the various servers. So if we have a thousand different servers that are running our website software, our web server software, if we can have the DNS server can constantly monitor those servers to make sure they're still healthy, they're still giving answers, giving responses in a timely manner. If not, those IP addresses can be removed from the list. They can be marked unhealthy and removed from the list, and and then. Um, even though no one has like there isn't a, a an, an IT person that noticed a problem and did anything to, to fix it, the load balancing name server will would automatically detect the problem and take that machine out of the rotation and prevent users from from connecting to a crashed server, right? But for this to work, the TTL has to be very short uh, because you, um, users would have to users would still be going to that same IP address that was crashed for whatever the duration of the TTL is. Okay. So it's not the best solution for for um, for fault tolerance, but it is, a, it is a good solution for load balancing, especially global load balancing, as we'll see uh, a little bit later on with the CDNs. Okay, another reason why you might want to give different answers to different people, give different IP addresses to different people for the same domain, is because we want to optimize latency. So latency is high for distant servers. If I'm connecting to a machine that's all the way across the world, it's going to take a long time for that to happen. If we have users from all around the world that are connecting to, let's say, Amazon.com, and we have, and Amazon has many servers, if Amazon can actually put those servers in different parts of the world, then the, the dynamic DNS servers can give IP addresses back to users that are somehow close to them, right? If the DNS server can look at your IP address and 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 determine from that number where you are, that's called IP geolocation, and then use that information to find what is the nearest um, server that I have, I can give you the specific best IP address, the closest IP address. Um, this is especially important for applications like the web because there are a lot of small requests, so latency is more important than throughput. Like I make one request and after I get that back, I make another request and so on. So you want those round trips to be really fast. So you want to communicate nearby. To show how latency varies, we can use a simple um, command line tool called ping. So I'm going to, you can, this is a trace and you can do this yourself on your own machine or you can do it on Murphy if you want to use those Linux command line tools that you might not have on your own machine. Um, NSLOOKUP is a command line tool for looking up DNS names. This is also mentioned in the Wireshark lab. So Tsinghua, uh, of course, is a very prestigious university in China. And this query will tell us what the IP address is. The, this is asking for the A record for this www.tsinghua.edu.cn website. Okay, so this is the IP address that comes back. Now I can ping that IP address. This is a command line tool that sends a message and kind of times how long it takes for a response to get back. And it repeats that experiment to get to get a series of, of answers. And when I do this, the round trip times I get are 400 milliseconds and you know 220 milliseconds roughly and so on. So that's a pretty long time. You know, 400 milliseconds is like something like that. Half a second, whatever. Um, so that people can notice that kind of a time difference. And if you add that up, if there are many round trips involved in fetching a website, this can actually lead to a page loading with a time of like 10 seconds, something that's really slow. Okay. Keep in mind the speed of light for um, the speed for light to travel around the world. So, you know, China is roughly halfway around the world. So it has to, the, the, the round trip is roughly all the way around the world. That is 130 milliseconds. So the actual speed of 220 milliseconds is not that much worse than the ideal best case scenario of going around. Of course, well, maybe the best case scenario would be to travel through the middle of the Earth, through the Earth's core. Um, but we don't have any fiber optic cables right now to go through the Earth's core. <laughs> It'll be slightly faster, right? Um, so there, there's a little bit of there's prop. This is dominated by propagation delay. There also is a little bit of nodal processing delay of of um, roughly a hundred milliseconds for these second ones. Okay, so that's that's kind of slow. You can compare this to connecting to Argonne National Labs, which is in Lamont, Illinois. So it's in the suburbs of Chicago, pretty close by, only about 
uh, let's say 40 miles away, something like that. Uh, when you can do the same lookup to get the IP address for that machine and ping that, and you'll see the round trip times are only about 20 milliseconds. So this is 10 times faster, okay, to go to a server that's close by. So if we we're ac so accessing this website is going to be a lot faster than accessing the uh, Chinese university website, right? We can also get some more details using the trace route command line tool. This is actually pretty cool. You can try it out. Um, you put the IP address of the destination and run it, and it will do a series of of, of pings in in different of different lengths to try to figure out what what path is actually being taken to get from here to the destination. It's not it's not totally accurate, and sometimes it's missing information, but it gives you a lot it gives you a lot of information often, and it also gives you the host names of the routers that you're contacting. So from an apartment in Evanston, so my apartment in Evanston, um, this uh, this request was going to some routers, a Comcast router in Morton Grove, which is the city two towns over to the west of here, from there to Chicago, from there to 350 East Cermak is uh, a big internet exchange point in Chicago that I mentioned in lecture where a lot of t uh, tier one ISPs are located. So this is gonna, where it's going to move from Comcast to a different ISP. It's going to move to it. So the ISP it moves to is a, it's called AS 6453. I'm not sure exactly what that is. You can actually look up the AS stands for autonomous system. So you could, you could look that up to see what it was, but you can see it goes from Chicago to San Jose. And as, as it's making this, this, as it's traveling, you can also see on the right hand side, how long it took to get there. So, so far we still have only been 11 milliseconds roughly to get to Chicago. Then it goes to San Jose, so all the way across the country. It takes 88 seconds to get there, so that's a significant change in time. Um, then a different location, San Jose, Santa Clara, also still in the valley, um, and, from, from, still, and still around 70, 80 milliseconds. From there, it goes to Los Angeles. And then from there, you see we start to lose the, uh, the host name information about the routers. But we see the time jumps from 75 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. Now we can imagine the difference that this jump is the Trans-Pacific cable, uh, you know, halfway around the world to uh, Asia. We can do the same experiment, reach to contacting the same um, Beijing IP address from a different des source, so from Northwestern's campus. So in this case. We start off in the tech building. So this is, I think this is, I, I may have done this when, um, I'm not sure if this is from MUD or from tech, but anyway, it starts off in tech. It goes through to a different Northwestern router, different Northwestern router. So like five different Northwestern routers. Eventually it gets to the internet too, which is a big uh, internet backbone project between universities that was started in the early days of the internet that was an import, important in the uh, the early uh, development of the internet and still used, uh, maintained by uh, universities. So anyway, it, it goes it goes into inter Internet too. From there, it's it's in Chicago at first, then Kansas, then um, probably Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, and then from there again we lose start to lose names. But then we see the time goes from 51 milliseconds up to 200 milliseconds. So this 12th hop here is where it crosses the Pacific and eventually reaches the um, same destination, probably through a different path. Okay. Now, if we visit at the website for a Chinese university, so this is a different Chinese university, uh, Zhejiang, and here I'm just going to I'm going to click this link and bring it up here. I think it, let me try uh, using a different browser because I think it, I I already visited on this session, so it might be cached. If I go here, I'm trying to is a little bit slow. Um, I was trying to show you an example of a website that's that's slow. Try it yourself. Um, and um, they may have made their page faster since I did this, but anyway, there was a time <laughs> uh, when I when I visited that page, and it, it was not too long ago, and it took like 10, 12 seconds for it to load um, because the server was in China and it's making a bunch of little requests. So um, most browsers have a tool to let you look at the timing of the of, of how things happen when you visit a page, and the total time uh, uh, co covers in this case the, the experiment was it wasn't until like ten thousand milliseconds. So ten seconds later, I had re retrieved all the data. So even though a single round trip to China is uh, only two hundred milliseconds, 
loading a page could take 10 seconds because there's a lot of requests that happen that have to happen sequentially and that depend on previous requests. So first I fetch the HTML for the home page, but I have to wait until that home page gets to me before I can parse that home page and figure out what are all the images that need to be loaded, what are all the CSS pages and JavaScript pages. And when I load one JavaScript uh, page, so it takes 200 milliseconds to make the request, it comes back, that might tell me to download other uh, JavaScript documents and so on and so forth. So there, there are multiple, um, there's a chain of dependencies and chain of requests that could take you know, many round trips and lead to uh, a slow experience on this website if I'm trying to access it from around the world. Okay, so one of the solutions to this problem, you know, if you're operating a website, you don't wanna, wanna have to, um, you don't want customers to have slow experience. You also don't want to have to set up your own servers all, all over the world to serve different customers. Instead, you can use a content delivery network, a CDN, which is a network of proxies, of caching HTTP proxies that are designed just to um, deliver my web content faster to people around the world. Okay, so the way this works is by having a special dynamic DNS server for the domain. So there are several different companies that provide this service. Akamai was, the, I think, the first and the most famous. Uh, this picture shows Cloudflare's networks. So, so Cloudflare has machines in all of these locations around the world. And the purpose of this is so that there is a nearby server, hopefully, that is storing a copy of the web content that you're trying to fetch. Okay, so if I make a request to... Um, often this is used for, like, just the large media like videos and images on a website so if i if i visit newyorktimes.com if there's a big image on the the home page that image might have a address of like cloud akamai.net slash nytimes slash home image dot jpg or something so i make a request to akamai actually to load that image and then akamai's dns server looks at my ip address the ip address of the requester to figure out where I am and what answer it should give. So it gives me the IP address of this Chicago server that it has. And then that server gets my HTTP request and hopefully gives me an answer. So those, those edge servers all around the world don't actually have my website software. They're just caching proxies. Just like the DNS, this is the same idea as a DNS resolvers that I showed earlier but this is working with HTTP protocol instead of DNS, okay? Now DNS is used to discover which of the edge locations I'm going to, but once I go to that edge location, um, it acts as a caching proxy. So if I, if, the, if a client, the client makes the request to the edge server, the edge server has to turn around and ask an origin server. There may be only one of these origin servers in one location, but all the edge servers around the world are, are making requests are accepting the requests and then asking the origin server for the data. I mean, that, that itself doesn't provide any benefit because everything is just, you're just added in a middleman for no reason, except when you remember the fact that HTTP um, responses can be cached. So if someone, if someone, when someone accesses a, a document, like does a get request on a URL, through this uh, content delivery network, the edge location will ask the origin server and get the data, but also will store a copy so that later on when there's a second request for the same document, the edge server can give an answer immediately. And it does not have to go to the origin server. So overall, the number of requests that have to go all the way to the origin, which could be far away, are pretty few, especially for the common documents. Most of the requests get handled directly by the edge locations. Uh, and so that allows you to um, have a single a single origin server that is actually has the data that the the H HTTP that, that gives the HTTP responses that can construct the HTTP responses. But then you have a bunch of of caching proxies around the world that store recent answers so that um, other customers in the same area will get copies. Okay, so HTTP has a cache control header that is much like the TTL and DNS that lets you control at the origin server how long you want your content to last in, in caches. Okay. All right, these are add-on services. So like you don't need to, you would originally design your website to just have one origin server. And then later on, you can add an edge server. This is off the shelf. You don't have to write any custom software here. This is just a generic HTTP proxy. 
a caching proxy and um, you can add this later to, to improve the performance for your for um, your globally distributed customers okay there are third-party services that provide this you want to rely on a third party because you personally don't want to have to manage servers all around the world so one final thought on DNS um, so DNS is critical for most internet applications if your local name server fails then your internet won't work. So very often if your internet's broken, it's not because your physical connection is broken, but maybe your local name server is not working. So um, if you if you did happen to know the IP address of the service you're trying to connect to, you could type it in and it would work. Next time your internet is broken, try that. Um, try just typing in an, an IP address and see if that works. Very often that's true. So in response to this, or uh, when, yeah, in response to the, the fact that a lot of internet problems are caused by flaky, unreliable name servers, Google provides a free public DNS server that is very reliable, and it's at the IP address 8.8.8.8 or 8.8.4.4. This is a very good, uh, useful backup option if your local DNS resolver is not working. And a lot of people use this by default, and I'm sure that Android phones use this, and probably Chrome by default uses this, even regardless of what your local um, server has configured. Now this is a service that costs Google a lot of money to operate because it handles a lot of traffic from around the world. I want you to stop and think about why Google would be providing the service for free. Why would Google want to help users to figure out what IP addresses are associated with, do with uh, domain names? Okay, hopefully you thought about that. Um, basically, you should think about what business Google is in. Google, like Facebook and, and others, are, are, is in the business of selling ads. And to do that, they need to know more as much as they can about the, the users. So this is providing a lot of useful information to Google. This lets Google basically track all the websites you visit because whenever you visit a website, you do a DNS request first. Okay, You ask what the IP address is for, for this domain. So um, Google will see. Um, they also, I mean, if you have any other Google services like Gmail, they'll kind of know They'll be able to associate your IP address with your account and your identity and your cookies. And they also will see, um, they can take all the DNS requests you make and say, okay, you're visiting all these domain, all these websites. Um, and that's, that's useful for their advertising business. DNS is also used by captive portals. So if you've ever joined free Wi-Fi and like visit a website and suddenly you go to a totally different website, that's because they're kind of hijacking DNS. And so you're asking for, you might visit like Northwestern at EDU to, to check your, or, you know, Canvas at Northwestern at EDU to check your assignments. But this captive portal, this free Wi-Fi connection you're on will, it has given you an IP address of a DNS server that will give you a fake answer at first and tell you maybe log in or accept their terms, something like that. So they actually will direct, keep directing you to some, some other website, no matter what domain you connect to. Okay, until you accept it, uh, until you do something that they want you to do. All right, um, so we talked about DNS today. DNS is the internet's directory service. It's distributed and hierarchical to achieve good performance. And we have, it has caching proxies that rec are, are request intermediaries that store and, and reuse recent responses. Those are those are exist both in DNS and they also this idea of caching proxies though is general and applies both to HTTP also to HTTP in content delivery networks. Uh, dynamic DNS servers cleverly craft their responses to provide a bunch of useful um, services like sets of functionality including load balancing and fault tolerance when you have a cluster of servers that want that you want to work together to provide a service. Content delivery networks also called CDNs that allow customers to get directed to the closest uh, service mirror if you have many copies of a service. So you're not just load balancing, but you're also connecting users to the nearest um, IP address. And finally, captive portals that hijack the internet and send you to um, whatever site they want you to. All right, uh, I hope that's useful. See you later.